<clears throat> it's a long story, and we don't got a lot of time. Just can't seem to find the right man. Maybe it's not a man you should be looking for. Gross. Come with me on a journey of the mind. Imagine in your orbital thought launcher a time where all the different companies weren't all the same company. Tough to imagine, I know. Somehow, beautifully, astoundingly, this all begins with Howard the Duck. Uh, I've got a headache. And I got the aspirin. <gasps> What a guy. He's a duck from outer space. He was a parody of his comic moment. He's a duck from space. That That's it. The 80s just started. Don't gotta be a whole thing. He ain't really destined for shit. He's a duck from space. He's a duck from space. As it turns out, Howard the Duck is kind of hard to make a movie out of, but we'll get to that later. The comic, however, inspired yet another comic. TMT creators Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird are brainstorming a new comic in whatever Massachusetts weather is like in 1983. They are an artist-writer combo of the independent persuasion. They want to, in their minds, parody the state of superhero comics with a grounded approach. Uncanny X-Men, The Legion of Superheroes, The Daredevils, The Mighty World of Marvel. It's the early 80s, so throw some ninjas in there. They are streetwise blabbermouths with a propensity for Generation X-like detached, unruffled, ennui, and pizza. It was simple and goofy, so in turn they should make it a silly, unserious animal like Howard the Duck. It just is. A duck from space, a transmuted shit-talking turtle posse from the culvert realm, it's the same picture. That was the point. Peter Lair draws a ninja turtle, Eastman adds a teenage mutant to the title to be as over the top as possible. A thing that will itself be parodied throughout the 90s and the rest of eternity. A shapeless void of fanatical naming structure that launched a thousand genre TV ships. They make a comic. It all started right here. So what happens when you hook up the underground 80s pop culture scene with a car battery? Well, you're living in it, kiddo. Release the snowball. Come with me on a journey. Whimsically to 1983, Motorola has just introduced the first mobile phone to the market. I was one. This is the moment with which the Ninja Turtles are born into. Eastman and Laird attempt to brainstorm some Japanese names, but they stop short, not quirky enough. They muddle quizzically. Two light bulbs explode in an apartment nearby. What if we name them after Italian Renaissance painters? Boom. 1984 rolls around and Eastman and Laird found the company Mirage Comics out of their home. They used a tax refund and a loan from an uncle to do so. Pretty punk rock, fam. Big things are often tiny snowballs when they start rolling. They sold the first issue however they could. It took a few weeks, but they sold 3,000 copies of it. That's the start of the snowball. Each new issue rolls further down the mountain. They made pop art 100% of its moment. Comics were a thing kids passed around all the time. Kids went nuts for the slightly naughty ninja narrative blended with hip hop and surf culture. Be everything, who cares? It's the 80s. A little indie comic startup launches directly into the veins of the cultural zeitgeist. The snowball is quickly gaining momentum. So let's jam a rockin' in that there snowball. In 1987, Eastman, Laird, and Mirage license our zesty, sparkling martial artist boys to Playmate Toys. A name you would know from, well, uh, I think Playmate's bread and butter was licensed stuff like Ninja Turtles, but you might know the name if you owned a uh, water baby. If you Google the words Playmate Toys, you get Ninja Turtles. You would most likely know that name because of Ninja Turtles. Smash Cut to Beach Sunset. It's the third best-selling action figure of all time before 
it was a TV show. No lie, my favorite toy when I was five was a refrigerator box to play with my Ninja Turtles in. I drew a whole city in there. They live, uh, they lived in the city with the Ghostbusters. <laughs> 1987, baby! Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is a billion dollar toy franchise out of the starting gate, which leads inevitably down the cartoon pipeline. Enter Murakami Wolf Films, tasked with making a little five-episode run to see if these mutated adolescents with latent violence envy can build an audience. Oh, gee, oh, Jesus. Oh, God. It runs for ten seasons. Then they toss a license to Konami to make a video game. It sells four million copies and has a leg that attacks you sometimes. It makes not so much sense, but I can still beat the damn level to this day because I was forged in the fires of Konami making weird video games since the beginning. I couldn't even get new video games until I beat the old ones. This game ruined my life for a year. That's, that's what I'm saying. I love it. It's perfect. Die. Where was I? Ah, uh, yes. The thing about rocket snowballs is exploding fuel makes them harder to control. At the end of the 90s, Eastman and Laird expressed some regret over some things they agreed to in this media detonation that which they have wrought. Sure, maybe the cartoons got a little silly, but as I've said many times in the journey since the first episode of this show, you have to adapt for the medium you're in. It is tough to argue that it didn't translate perfectly to every single medium they put it in because TMNT set sales records across the board in everything it tried and kids just could not get enough. But would that license translate to a movie, for example? Surely the gravy train had run out of, uh... Is, gra is gravy the answer? Does a gravy train run on gravy or carry gravy? It doesn't matter. I'm eight. A real Raphael kind of year. But did you know? The first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie is the highest grossing independent movie of all time when it comes out in the year of our lord 1990. This particular highest grossing record for an indie movie lasts all the way up until the Blair Witch Project blasts off in the street nine years later. Time is kind of funny sometimes and how it all fits together. You know what else started nine years ago? This show talking about this movie. What a coincidence. A revisit designed with palpable nostalgia in tow, but also I just really love the Ninja Turtles and it's important to keep in mind that every huge corporate property started somewhere tiny as a labor of love. Obviously I'm getting ahead and or behind myself. This film shouldn't have happened. It all goes back to the spirit of Howard the Duck, which is also key here because Howard the Duck the movie in 1986 had just bombed at the box office. Cosmically, Howard the Duck made it harder for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie to exist. Time is a wasteland of echoing hiccups. So the cartoon, an easier sell, launches into the world before any of the movie conversations are entertained in any meaningful way. Producer Gary Proper, a name you'd really only know from all three original Ninja Turtles movies, and the only name that moves a needle here, proposes they shoot the movie in Hong Kong for cost reasons and reaches out to a production company called Golden Harvest who greenlights a $3 million movie. They double that before production even begins. Many, many conversations happen. New Line Cinema jumps on the bodacious bandwagon and the decision is ultimately made to shoot this movie in North Carolina. The through line is that this movie almost didn't happen. It's kind of just every step in the process. But effort and perseverance prevail and I think they made something that is truly special within the entire cinematic landscape of Ninja Turtles movies. What Russian novel, embracing more than 500 characters, is set in the Napoleonic Wars? War and Peace. Jim Henson's Creature Shop made the animatronic suits that are unrivaled to this day. Absolutely incredible work. And work he very much did not want to do. 
Jim was iffy on whether this would taint his legacy or not. Ninja Turtles in the late 80s is probably and hysterically scary to parents with the swords and the angst and the pizza. That's generally not a great sign during a film production. I think that's what's so important about the Ninja Turtles. It's in the title. Hey, don't take this too seriously. It's anthropomorphic reptile children whom fight good, which is why the photography of this movie is so breathtaking. It's kind of hard not to take it seriously. The turtles are just there. It challenges something within yourself and within the box office, as it turned out. This film is a sensation, an absolutely gorgeous photographic meditation that does something pretty key. The camera does not celebrate our puppeteered turtle friends. They exist within a real world. They feel pain and loss. I think to this day, the results from cinematographer John Fenner are unparalleled. Hey, you know what CGI doesn't do? Axe back. This achievement is an absolutely incredible feat. It's Ninja Turtles with a more serious tone, which doesn't mean that every adaptation should just be one thing. But I'm glad the 1990, dare I say, work of art stands up in a long and colorful history of Turtles movies. New Line releases this hurtling snowball lovingly into the world. It felt like any direction Eastman and Laird looked, dollar signs and a lot of incredibly good media decisions were in quick pursuit. And under the tutelage of director Steve Barron, they made something truly special. A comic book movie, let alone an independently funded comic book movie, this hasn't happened. Dang Girl hasn't happened. Judge Dredd hasn't happened. Shit, The Phantom hasn't happened. There is no blueprint. Steven Crew made a film not knowing the world they were launching it into. And there's two more movies that happened in the early 90s. Secret of the Ooze, an incredibly fast sequel, definitely tones down much of the violence and went in a more comedic direction. Not sure Eastman and Laird were the biggest fans of Secret of the Ooze, but I think it's interesting we have such a wide swath of takes on the Ninja Turtles in all kinds of mediums. I think Secret of the Ooze somehow rules just as hard and it's singing entirely in its own key. And it's still stunning to look at. It's an entertaining sequel. Two is another solid triple at the box office as well. The third movie which certainly has some detractors, especially the critical reception at the time, it really just kind of does its own thing. If it was called Turtles in Time and also adapted even 2% of the classic 1991 video game in the same name, it would have blown the doors off of every cinema in town. IP wasn't the conglomerate force it is now back then. Turtles 3 tells a remarkably small story about a small Japanese village in feudal Japan. The Turtles? Help an uprising. It's pretty awesome to watch as an adult and again, beautiful photography. Don't sleep on three, even if the audience is dead a little. Its tone is the Three Stooges support an uprising in feudal Japan kind of thing. It is certainly not for everyone. I, in particular, find it entirely charming. Yoshi for life. There, I talked about Turtles 3. Give me that Chivo. From there, it gets a little foggy. Playmates Toys released a catalog advertising a fourth movie in it, so conversations had definitely happened between a few parties. Peter Laird does some concept for a Turtles 4, quote unquote, a new mutation kind of thing, and I am so sorry this is going exactly where you think it is. The first era of the Ninja Turtles as a staple of popular culture ends with a whimper, Saban. Yes, that one. Produces a live action series for TV in 1997, loosely based on these discussions. Okay, so this has been bugging me for 26 years, so I'm just gonna use this platform to litigate this. Um, hear me out. Why did all the boys get to be named after artists, but the girl turtle has to be named after a hot statue? I mean, I know the answer, but you could have gone with Sophonispa, Lavinia, Katarina, Elisabetta, Plotilla. You probably get the point. I think it illustrates pretty cleanly that you have to do something with the Ninja Turtles when you license them. 
Jesus Christ. Ninja Turtles are beginning to fade from the zeitgeist. No longer the money juggernaut it once was. The 90s sun is getting a little low in the sky. But also, uh, yikes, don't, don't do this. Before you break your head against the bricks, tell me if I'm in your will. Yeah, I'm leaving you my self-discipline. By 1999, I think it started to feel like the end of the road. The snowball was coming back down to earth, nestled in the air by endless successful cartoon reboots. It was a slow descent, but maybe an important lens to view our current reality through. Not every brand gets to be a successful multi-hyphenate consumer grade nuclear weapon in all types of media. Just type Mattel and movie on Google and have yourself a Sunday. It's bleak out there. By the year 2000, Eastman and Laird had already successfully took over the entirety of entertainment media with a comic they printed themselves and were stoked to have a small audience of comic fans. What a ride. But all good things come to an end as people need to live their lives. Kevin Eastman sells his stake to Peter Laird in the year of our Glorb 2000. The 2000s had interesting film forays into the Ninja Turtles iconography. Kevin Monroe released a fun animated movie, a spiritual if not literal sequel to the 90s turtle movies in TMNT. There are many fans, it does okay at the box office, but not what it used to be. And then Laird sells the whole shebang to Viacom in late 2009, which was selling it essentially to Nickelodeon. We all get older, but our heroes stay the same age forever. It's all era's tours now, baby. Things get pretty quiet on the film front. Um, I'm not sure the cartoon Snowball ever really fully stops. It's still sailing out there somewhere in the universe. With hundreds of examples of ways this could have gone in the last 15 years, I think Nickelodeon's treatment of our turtle posse has been industry leading, artistically and and business-wise. I think as the stewardship changes hands, we see the biggest imaginable bet ever lined up in a film space. North of a $100 million bet, a 2014 release. If you are in any way curious what a Michael Bay post-Transformers Ninja Turtles movie would look like, ah, uh, here you go. It gets people to look. For sure, it does well enough to warrant a sequel and the freak nasty out of the shadows movie needs to be seen by everyone. I'm a sucker for the mute and throw on your own soundtrack uh, appreciation of strange films. So here's the cheat code. Just throw on gunship behind out of the shadows. Uh, you're welcome. Anyway, this one doesn't do great at the box office costing more and making less than half as much. Hey. It happens. I think you can't do anything forever. There comes time, one might say, after making a property that successfully exists simultaneously as a comic, cartoon, movie, serial, video game, they've done it all. Eastman and Laird were the blueprint because they truly cared about their baby until it became so big that you need to set it free. And by free, I obviously mean controlled by a large multinational corporation, Nickelodeon, protect our boys. The thing about a Ninja Turtles product is that you need to get all of the pieces right. The characters, the villains, the tone, the attitude, the humor, the childlike chaos of fighting a cantankerous rhinoceros named Rocksteady. It takes a lot of money to compete on the zeitgeist level, but it also takes people that like, care? Here's a fun place to end part three, I think. IDW did a comic series with Eastman as co-writer that was rad. Also, it was co-written by Tom Waltz, who I worked with on the Borderlands comics back in the day, Small Freakin' World. Also, the IDW Ninja Turtles books are great. They started in 2011, and they're still going. Pockets of artistic, whimsical pop culture art are out there if you can break free of the hose of content sluice for even half a moment. The cycle of reboots is accelerating. 
the story obviously goes on, but I don't want people to lose sight of where ginormous pop art even comes from. Two dudes just wanted to make a comic book about imperfect dipshit turtle teens. And somehow the idea was never really corrupted along the way. We can argue about which adaptations worked better or worse for each of us personally. But the through line is that everyone has different favorites. So allow me to share one irrefutable fact about the films. The story of the Ninja Turtles is about family. No, that's no good. Wait, no, that's... I have to land somewhere cooler than that after nine years. In my head, the quintessential film Donatello is Corey Feldman. He just lays under every scene and absolutely destroys it. He's only in two of the original three movies. There's a new Donnie in Secret of the Use, and at the gentle age of nine, I noticed, and I was like, who the f*** is this guy? Corey Feldman illustrates one of my absolute favorite things about the Ninja Turtles as uniquely American icons. So I'm just going to unpack this uh, out in the open. Built into the fabric of this universe is four SoCal surfer bro turtles who survive and fight crime in New York City because pizza and sewers. Radical. Cowabunga, even. If there is a better personification of this juxtaposition than Corey Feldman, I anxiously await your rebuttal in the comments down below. The Turtle Boys are a contradiction of geography, of time, and of culture, an idea so potent we're still lining up for it. Oh, and while we're here, what did you know? Cowabunga was a phrase invented by Howdy Doody because they needed something vaguely Native American sounding. What's more American than that? No, I don't know, Bunga. Where is he? And real quickly here about the new film Mutant Mayhem, without spoilers, the new Ninja Turtles movie is an absolutely priceless animated movie with a ton of heart and limitless style coming out of every frame. It's fantastic. Written and directed by Jeff Rowe, who Marvel teamed up to make the Mitchells vs. the Machines with Mike Rianda. Go watch it, it's on Netflix. Rowe goes on after this film to meet Seth Rogen, and now we have a new Ninja Turtles movie and we went to see it a masterpiece that lets the teenage in the ninja turtle title breathe a bit with actual teens playing the turtles a stylistic breath of beautiful air this movie nails every single aspect of a fantastic turtles film it's hilariously chaotic beauty i bring all of this up to say it's doing okay, but it's very worth your time. It absolutely nails it. Please, please go see it. Hashtag not sponsored. I stack this boastful turtle sandwich to prove a point. Media has absolutely become too many versions of too many things. It's exhausting. But when someone makes an honest effort to put forth the actual mayhem inherent to the teenage era itself, an element of the original itself an element of the original turtles that was filed away over time the mischief mischief is in short supply these days and i'll be damned if these deranged little late jurassic stowaways don't deliver something so fresh it's earnestly kind of breathtaking the turtles are supposed to be counterculture action heroes men of stature of studied wisdom after all, as the wise man say, forgiveness is divine, but never pay full price for late pizza. Really makes you think. A reminder of simpler times. The movies all try to do different things, which I also love. Who wants the same movie over and over and over again? Swing for the fences. Be weird. Be yourself. Be mischievous. I can't believe this franchise is still going on as strong as it is. There's something timeless about our Ninja Turtle friends, a company that started in a house. What's more mischievous than that?
If you crave more movies with Mikey, I have great news for you. We did a piece on Barbie that's out right now on Nebula. It's pretty, it's, it's really good. I think it's very good. It's really very good. I thought it would be really fun to do a piece about how Barbie has three, well, at least three main characters. Check it out. If you haven't heard of Nebula, it's a streaming service run by and for creators who are tired of being at the mercy of a streaming platform we don't own or have any stake in. It's also completely ad-free and it's the only place you can see Maggie Mayfish's Nebula original Unrated, as well as Lindsay Ellis's newer videos like her new one about family-friendly Vegas, which rules. As a Nebula first channel, it's also where Filmjoy videos go to live a happy life before being forced to fight for survival on the tough streets of YouTube. If you sign up using our link, go.nebula.tv slash filmjoy, you can get a year of Nebula for only $30. If you like what we do and you want to see us keep making videos, supporting us on Nebula is a fantastic way to do that. And if you like more tangible things, head on over to our store, catawampus.inc. Our shirts are printed locally here in Texas, and we ship everything right out of our very house. The was destroyed one. You know this. You know this. And if you use code TMAT23, you get 15% off your order. Smooches. <laughs>